Jess Silverman again, welcome. You might have just seen my previous video on obesity and obesity being a chronic health disease. I'm going to discuss now the sleeve gastrectomy, the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy as a, temp a permanent weight loss operation. This is the commonest operation I do and one of the most common operations performed in Australia uh, for morbid obesity. It's done under a general anaesthetic, uh, so you'd be fast asleep for your surgery. It's done as a keyhole operation. There'll be five small incisions, all in the upper portion of your abdomen. Now remember, you'll be asleep for the operation, but I'll try to describe some of the details. The anaesthetist will pass a guide tube, or something called a bougie, that goes into your esophagus, then stomach, then into the first part of the small bowel. I then use a device that divides and seals blood vessels that would usually connect the stomach to the colon below and the sleeve on top. So I use this device that divides and seals all the blood vessels around the greater curve of the stomach till the, the stomach's completely mobile. At that point, I'll ask the anaesthetist to get, make sure the guide tube again is into the first part of the small bowel. I then use a stapling device now this device actually clamps and on each arm is three rows of tiny staples. They're titanium, they're about that tall in size and there's a blade that cuts in between. So the device clamps and divides, clamps and divides and normally it's about five or six firings of that staple gun um, until that part of the stomach's removed. So that part of the stomach's taken through the largest of the incisions in the abdominal wall. Um, so that's left is all you have of your stomach. So that's the sleeve. That's where the name gets from, a sleeve gastrectomy, because you're left with just a sleeve or a banana-shaped stomach. So how does it work? Well, the obvious way, number one, is restriction. So you can't fit much in now. You've gone from having a saddlebag of a stomach that might have fit one to two litres of fluid and food in it. Now you have a banana shaped stomach that could probably only fit around 200 mils in it at least initially. So restriction, you physically can't eat as much. The second way the sleeve works, and this is quite exciting and it just goes to show that obesity really is a chronic disease and there are a lot of hormones at play that maintain metabolism and appetite when you're uh, obese, but just one of these hormones, for example, is something called ghrelin. Now, ghrelin's made in the top part of the stomach, or mainly the top part of the stomach, which is called the fundus. Um, the fundus, um, when empty, would release ghrelin, and ghrelin sends signals to your brain to let you know that you're hungry. So, at this surgery, we've actually removed that top part of the stomach, the fundus that makes the ghrelin, um, that causes hunger. So if you speak to patients that have had this operation, and it's almost invariable, they'll say things like, I no longer had the same relationship with food. They'll say, for example, I used to have cravings, I no longer have their cravings. They'll say, for example, when they used to be having breakfast, at the same time they'll be planning lunch, and now they say they have to look at their watch and go, oh, it's time to eat. So there's a, a, a hormonal component about this operation. Another thing that has been found about this operation is that it really has also an anti-diabetic effect. Now we know losing weight alone will it cause an improvement for those that have diabetes in blood sugar levels and blood sugar control. But this has an improvement that is actually seen beyond just weight loss. So how that works, and the theory is that because we've changed the shape of the stomach, that carbohydrates actually exit the stomach quicker and they make their way down to the end of the small bowel quicker and that causes a release of insulin-like peptides or proteins, which causes an improvement in your blood sugar level. So it's got a good anti-diabetic effect. Now for the sleeve post-surgery, you'll spend three nights in hospital. As explained, you'll be on two weeks fluid only diet, two weeks of a pureed diet, back to a normal textured diet at the four week mark. So after the four weeks following surgery, I'll see you in the clinic. If you're not getting any heartburn symptoms, we can stop the antiacid tablet at that point. 
you will need to stay on your multivitamins lifelong, however. So they're really the benefits of the sleeve, the weight loss, and also the improvement of weight-related health conditions. Um, for my results, and I've had 100 patients, over 100 patients that have had the sleeve come through the PEAK program, so it's with our team of dietitian psychologists. The 12-month weight, weight loss results are over 70% excess weight loss, which um, is, is a really good results. In terms of the complication rates, and I'm going to about to discuss complications now, but the ones I've seen, I haven't have had any leaks um, touch wood so far um, with the program that I've introduced here. So look, in terms of the complications following this operation, and it really, I need you to bear in mind that if you're morbidly obese or B, I, BMI 40 or BMI 35 with obesity related health conditions, the risk from you maintaining your weight as it is currently is actually greater than the risk from an operation. That being said, there are some risks from surgery. The, the early risks that are significant, the rate of which would be somewhere under 1%. I've mentioned leak, and what I mean by leak is when you, uh, if this staple line fails to heal adequately, i.e. you get gastric juices that are now within the intra-abdominal cavity. So patients that would experience this uh, would um, have more pain than it is expected. Uh, they might have some difficulty breathing. Uh, if they have a fever, generally that would be a late sign. But it's the reason you spend three nights in hospital, so I can be very vigilant to see if there's any changes that might necess necessitate further uh, investigations or a turn to theatre. It's a reason you're on a fluid only diet for the first two weeks and then a soft diet after that to make sure that that heals up adequately. But it's also a reminder to you if you're at home, you're not feeling well, if you have any concerns really you need to call me, um, either the rooms or via the hospital, um, come into the emergency department if you're having any problems so we can assess it there. And it's not that complications don't happen, I know that they do, it's just a matter of having them recognised and dealt with early. If someone does have a leak and it's early, um, initial management would be diagnosis, then a return to theatre, a keyhole surgery, to wash out any contamination, place a drain, and then to see where to from here. But on average, in the literature, a patient that has a leak after a sleeve gastrectomy would spend about a month in hospital. So it's a very significant complication. The other complications would include those that you would have at any keyhole operation, which would include bleeding or injury to other organs, such as the bowel or spleen. Another complication that is just akin to this operation is one which I call narrowing, i.e. if the staple line is made uh, too close to the angle, the lower angle of the stomach. You might be well on a fluid only diet, but if you try eat solids, you might think get the food caught or you might have difficulty tolerating foods. If this is the case, um, often we'd diagnose it with a barium swallow, so a contrast swallow to see if there is a narrowing. Most often these can be treated with an endoscopy and a balloon dilatation. Occasionally you might need an operation to deal with that. So they're the main early complications. In terms of complications that happen late, and really they're far and few between, and the ones I mentioned really uh, are almost expected and minor. So one of the benefit about this operation, it doesn't have the long-term complications that might be seen with the gastric band or the gastric bypass operation. That being said, um, there is a theoretical chance of having more reflux, or more reflux symptoms. And the reason behind this is that we've changed the shape of the stomach from being a high volume, low pressure system, and now it's a low volume, high pressure system. So there may be a tendency for reflux. Now if my hands here are the diaphragm over your esophagus, at surgery I make an assessment of the diaphragm, i.e. the hiatus, and if there's any weakness or deficit in the hiatus or hiatus hernia, I'll put some stitches to tighten it up. 
I haven't really had issues with patients having significant reflux after this operation. Occasionally we do need to continue the anti-acid tablets post-surgery and this tends to be in a group that has had reflux preceding their sleeve gastrectomy. Though if you read the literature, there is a number of patients needing to have a second stage weight loss operation, i.e. something like the gastric bypass, to deal with reflux symptoms that they've had following the sleeve gastrectomy. The other long-term complication, and it's not really a complication, it just goes back to the concept of obesity being a chronic disease, is that of weight regain. And that's what we see with all the obesity operations, which is really why it's important to be mindful about the PEAK program um, to make the necessary adjustments to your diet, um, to your exercise behaviour and also to the way you live your life to be able to maintain weight loss in the long term because we're going to be managing your obesity because it's a chronic disease um, over your life.